Senior Vice President of Basketball for the NCAA, Dan Gabbitt, joins us now on SportsCenter. And Dan, three Sundays from now, we'll have the bracket in our hands. And in advance of that, I just want to have a conversation with you about, about the net rankings and how they'll be used and just try to provide a little clarity for me as much as for our viewers about, about just that. So let's start with, with the net. What, what's your sense of how that new ranking will be used in the room? Well, Scott, it's great to be with you, and, and uh, the committee is very excited about having this new tool to use. It replaces the RPI, as you know, after 37 years, and it's, uh, it, I think it's a much improved way to rank and evaluate the teams. Uh, it's both a results-oriented and a predictive metric, whereas the RPI was just results-oriented uh, only. And so I think it's much more... Uh, 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 much more modern and uh, contemporary and allows the committee to have a much more uh, powerful tool. I think I speak for most everyone in saying hallelujah for, for getting rid of the RPI. And there's really no need to bash it moving forward because it's in the past. But, but the process to arrive here, how, how, was it painful? Like how did you all uh, solicit sort of information and land where you currently sit? Well, initially it was a recommendation by the coaches. The NABC, the National Association of Basketball Coaches, made a recommendation to the basketball committee in, in July of 2016 to do away with the RPI and, and to come up with what they were calling a composite metric that had both results-oriented and predictive um, uh, measures to it. And we set on this path to develop this new metric, um, used the, the guidance of, of, of experts in the game uh, that, that are the know the analytics field in college basketball, uh, ultimately worked with Google Cloud Professional Services to develop this metric and, uh, and put it in place in August this year for use in this year's tournament. And uh, we used it uh, three weeks ago when, when the committee put out their top 16 in the bracket preview show as if a tournament were to start at that time. So they've had to be able to use it uh, in real time and we'll do so uh, in, in a couple weeks time in New York when they gather for selection week. I'm glad you referenced that, that, uh, that initial look at the 16 because it's not just 1 through 16 from the net ranking. So you mentioned results versus predictive. H how do those get weighted? Is it as simple, Dan, as saying your, your results are what get you in and then the predictive is how we seed? It's not quite as simple as that, Scott, probably, but there is, uh, there is some measure of that. You know, I think that the committee very much uh, will rely on results uh, to select the at-large teams. You're going to earn your way into the tournament by who you played, how did you do, and where you played them. Um, but once the teams are selected, either as at-large selections or, or automatic qualifiers by winning their tournament, then they have the tough task of seeding the field 1 through 68. And I think uh, that's where the new metric, as, long, as well as other metrics that are on the team sheet, uh, and there are other ones the committee uses besides just the net ranking, may be able to be helpful um, using a little level of prediction um, in, in deciding how teams are seeded uh, based on um, factors other than just their results, but how good they are at what they do, and what their net efficiency is, both offensively and defensively. Um, and we think that this, this new tool can help in that regard with seeding. Ultimately, though, it comes down to who gets in and who doesn't. And, and just, I think, a fun exercise, if we were to take, say, the net ranking of a team like Wofford, and there are a number of smaller schools. Wofford, a SoCon school, it's ranked. They're in the top 20. They're, they're number 20 at the moment. But then when we look at quadrant one results, they're three and four there. But if we were to compare them, and just for the sake of this conversation, with a team like Arizona State, they're not in the top 60, but they've got a better quadrant one record, more wins there. If you were to compare those two head-to-head, -head, how do you differentiate? Well, it's always a little uh, dangerous to, you know, to talk I know, specific I know, comparisons I know. <laughs> before we get to selection week. Uh, but it's a good, very good question. You know, Wofford uh, is having a fantastic season. Uh, the Southern Conference overall is very good and deep this year. Uh, they're 16-0 and 0 in the league. Um, with the quadrant system that was adopted last year for the first time, um, wins that they have, for example, this year on the road against Furman, as well as against UNC Greensboro and East Tennessee State, are now first quadrant wins, where in the past those games would likely have been top 100 wins, but not top 50 wins, because UNCG, for example, and East Tennessee State are both uh, ranked in the net ranking in the low 60s. So it does help this quadrant system the committee's used on a team sheet 
to recognize a broader uh, selection of opponents that the teams play and thus the results against them. Um, it certainly, I think, is going to benefit Wofford in that case. And Arizona State has had some fantastic wins non-conference. Um, you know, they, they also have beaten uh, uh, Washington, the, the Pac-12 leader, at home just a couple of weeks ago. And we'll see how their season plays out. But uh, that's a pretty good comparison of two teams that are frequently uh, compared by the committee, Scott. You know, one from a, a, a major conference that has a chance to play a lot of uh, Quadrant 1 and Quadrant 2 games. And then one from a mid-major that may have had a really good, successful season, have a really high winning percentage, but doesn't have the number of opportunities against uh, first and second quadrant teams. I get the sense, Dan, this year in particular, be it a Wofford or a Belmont or a Lipscomb, there, I could keep going. There are a number of teams in that sort of uh, flavor, if you like, uh, not power conferences, that, that I think a lot of folks that watch the game think those are good basketball teams. And then the question is, if you don't win and you don't get in, then what's the path to get in? Is, is that why these quadrant, uh, the quadrants have been looked at and, and tweaked a bit last year to try to give them a better shot to, to, to earn credit, so to speak? Yeah, very much so. You know, the intent there was to, uh, to allow for a broader uh, group of teams that um, can be used as quality opponents and thus quality wins if, if a team were to, you know, to get those wins as well as to recognize where the game is played. So quadrants are figured out more, j not just based on where a team's ranked, right. but whether the games were played at home, neutral, or on the road. And, and even games in the past that may have been really bad losses and ended up in the fourth kind of column of the team sheet. Now, if those losses happen on the road in conference, for example, oftentimes they're third quadrant losses, and it kind of minimizes uh, what is, you know, what's a tough thing to do, and that's to win on the road. And yet, as we both know, you know the tournament is played on the road or in a neutral setting. So the, the committee is trying to evaluate the team's ability to win away from home uh, because that's what, how the term is played, away from someone's home gym. I don't envy the job of the committee because you can never make everybody happy. But w with that thought in mind, let's get down to brass tacks and why I really wanted to have you on. What, what would have to happen for Maryland to get a couple of buys? Just put them like buy, just <laughs> advance them. Is there anything we could do here? Send you a hat well, or something, some swag. Uh, 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 anything you got, we'll consider, Scott. Uh, okay. I know you're, you know, you follow Terps closely, I and uh, they're having a heck of a season. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, two great players, right, and Anthony Cowan and Fernando Bruno, and uh, and they're fourth place right now in the Big Ten and having a hell of a year. Yeah, they're doing fine. Yeah, here, I, I, you know what? I'll tell Turge, I'll tell Turge, just try to knock off Penn State in the road, try to beat Michigan at home, and, and I'll let them, I'll let them do the heavy lifting. They don't need me to carry their water for them. And as I say, it's an impossible job you all do, but people like you and me that love the game, uh, we're, we're fascinated to see how things shake out. I really appreciate you giving me the time to help provide a little clarity of what it is you all are going to be doing in these uh, next few weeks. Thanks so much, and I hope we have a great tournament. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate you. Enjoy the madness.